The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. Is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Dolahungva. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. Acoma Pueblo in New Mexico is dropping its lawsuit against the Indian Health Service in exchange for restoring its local hospital. In November, IHS shut down the Acoma Canoncito Laguna Hospital by cutting off emergency medical services along with inpatient care and reducing the number of doctors and nurses. The hospital was converted to an urgent care unit, offering limited services during regular business hours. The hospital is located in the Pueblo of Acoma and is more than 60 miles west of Albuquerque. When hospital services were limited, it forced patients to drive the long distance to get medical help. In early January, Chief Judge Beryl Howell granted the Pueblo's motion for a temporary restraining order. That prevented IHS from closing the emergency room or reducing its current services at the end of the month. The Acoma Canacito Laguna Hospital has provided primary care and other health services to the surrounding tribal communities for decades, which also includes the small Navajo community of Tohajali. The Blackfeet Nation in Montana is helping its neighbors by handing out vaccines to residents in Canada. More than 98% of Blackfeet citizens are vaccinated, and tribal leaders saw a need to help others. So last week, they offered a vaccination clinic. Cars lined up for miles down the road at a local clinic on the border by Alberta, Canada. 1,200 people were vaccinated at the four-day event. Many of them were from the Blackfoot Confederacy in Canada, which are relatives to the Blackfeet. James McNeely is the public information officer for the tribe. He says they are just practicing the traditions of their culture. But Blackfoot philosophy is that we help everyone, no matter what. This is a human thing. It's about saving lives. Uh, you know, to us, there's still no border there. To us, it's about helping one another and, and to care for each other. And that's what we were doing, and that's what we, we continue to do. McNeely says they also wanted to return the favor because at the start of the pandemic, when the Blackfeet were low on PPE, their Canadian relatives brought them supplies. Indigenous members of Mexico's Zapatista movement are setting sail to invade Spain, symbolically. 500 years ago, the Spanish set sail and invaded what became Mexico. The voyage is in reverse with the Zapatistas sailing to Spain. There are four women, two men, and one transsexual woman who left from Isla Mujer, which is off the coast of Cancun. It was one of the first areas the Spaniards landed. A group of Otomi indigenous people in support of the symbolic invasion were on hand to see them off. Before the indigenous Zapatistas left port, they hung a banner that read, A Journey Through Life. The voyage across the Atlantic Ocean to Spain will take several weeks. A landmark ruling in New Mexico sets the standard for high-speed internet for public schools. About 10% of New Mexico children are Native American and often have major barriers to online and in-person learning. The ruling requires state officials to immediately determine which students are lacking quality internet or devices and to provide them with what they need, including transportation, if they can't get fast internet at home. The ruling also covers teachers who don't have access to high-speed internet at home. The majority of schools in New Mexico have opened to in-person learning this month after being closed since last spring due to the pandemic. But school districts serving tribal areas are still under lockdown orders. In an effort to promote peace and healing, the city of Harrisville, Utah, replaced a monument that honors a Shoshone chief. The historical marker is the site where Chief Cherokee was killed in 1850, Harrisville is 40 miles north of Salt Lake City. Cherokee was known for being friendly to white settlers in the area. 
However, he was shot by Urban Stewart and is in a dispute that remains questionable. The city of Harrisville partnered with the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation and the Weber County Heritage Foundation to replace the first marker that had been damaged. They hope people will be inspired to do more research about local history. The weekend's ceremony included a Shoshone blessing. Washington State is replacing the statue of an Oregon Trail pioneer and missionary with another one that honors a Native American leader. For years, Billy Frank Jr. fought for treaty rights and joined others in staged fish inns demanding a right guaranteed by their treaties. He was jailed more than 50 times, but his effort paid off. Now Frank, who was an Nisqually citizen, will be honored for his advocacy by having a statue made in his likeness. His statue will be part of the U.S. Capitol's National Statuary Hall collection. And you can read more about this effort on our website, IndianCountryToday.com. Look for the headline, Billy Frank Jr., A Warrior for Justice. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thelahungva. When we come back, we remember the women and girls who have gone missing. It's Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Awareness Day. May 5th is National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. Native women face murder rates more than 10 times the national average. More than 5,000 American Indian and Alaska Native women are missing. 55% of Native women have experienced domestic violence, and that's according to the U.S. Department of Justice. So it's probably short numbers. Joining us today is Mary Catherine Nagel. She's a partner at Pipestem and Nagel, she represents the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center and works on issues facing women. Mary Catherine has written and produced several plays relating to American Indians and the law. Welcome, Mary Catherine. Good afternoon, good evening. It's good to see you. So over the years, we've seen an awareness about this issue, but what, what's the big picture and what remains to be done? You know, there's been a lot of advocacy at the grassroots level for, for generations on this issue. And of course, you know, we all know this violence against Native women began with the colonial conquest of our nations and violence against our women was a very strategic tactic used to conquer our nations. And unfortunately, that's, you know, um, because that violence has never been directly addressed, we're still dealing with it today. Today, we have had progress. You know, folks are probably familiar with laws like Savannah's Act, Not Invisible Act. And those are, those are wonderful achievements. And those are achievements made possible through the advocacy of our tribal leaders, victims' families, victims' advocates, Native women, uh, spokeswomen out there who, you know, have been fighting for this issue. I think what's important to remember is that those laws specifically that I just mentioned that were signed into law last October, do not restore the criminal jurisdiction that the Supreme Court erased in Oliphant, which severely limits the ability of tribal nations to arrest and criminally prosecute uh, homicides committed against tribal citizens, Native women on tribal lands if they're committed by a non-Indian, which many of them are, and also does not provide funding for tribal law enforcement, tribal courts, victim services, tribal governmental institutions. And that's another issue that we face in Indian country is lack of resources. Um, it's also an issue uh, that we're hearing from many federal law enforcement agencies as well, uh, who claim that they cannot investigate these cases because they simply do not have the law enforcement personnel on ground. So I think moving forward, one thing that we're really advocating for is first and foremost, just Restore, restoration of tribal sovereignty and jurisdiction, um, full stop, so that our tribal nations can fully protect anyone living within their borders as is their inherent sovereign right to do so. And we're also looking for greater funding, but also too, at the end of the day, collaboration and dedication. You know, I think that the FBI, the United States Attorney's Offices, I think they have a federal trust duty and responsibility from the hundreds and hundreds of treaties they signed with our tribal nations to investigate and prosecute these cases. And right now there's a lot of discretion 
Um, and right now, the folks that are currently in position so far have not, for the most part, prioritized these cases. And so even though in many instances, the victims' families know very well or, or have a short list of suspects um, who as to who murdered their daughter or their niece or their loved one, those cases are not being adequately investigated if investigated at all. Oftentimes, too, they're being written off by federal authorities as a, um, a suicide or an accident or natural causes uh, when that's not the case. And so it's going to take a lot of work. Uh, Savannah's Act, again, and not in this black are steps in the right direction. But I think that's where uh, those of us who are advocates in the field are, are we're focusing right now. You mentioned resources, and one part of that is does, does it need to have legislation to get these new resources or can the Justice Department say, this is important to us, we're gonna fund it? Absolutely, the Justice Department does have some discretion to provide more funding to tribal law enforcement uh, and tribal governmental institutions to deal with this crisis. But at the end of the day, the most helpful and direct way to get it done would be to have Congress to authorize this kind of appropriation. Unfortunately, those of us, I know NIWRC, my client, SBI, Sovereign Bodies Institute, National Congress of American Indian, and others who were advocating for the passage of Savannah's Act, specifically asked for Savannah's Act to include funding for tribal law enforcement, tribal victim services, and we were told that that was not politically possible at the time, that the bill would not pass if a funding was attached to it. So um, I know we're also working on the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, which um, the version HR 1620 out of the House if passed, uh, would increase in some ways tribal uh, funding for these efforts because we also understand that you know we're suffering from an epidemic of domestic violence and sexual assault against our native people and in particular our native women on tribal lands. And unfortunately, there is a reality that the more domestic violence is allowed to continue without consequence, the closer you get to a homicide. Oftentimes, domestic violence is a crime that escalates in nature. So if there's not an intervention when when it's sort of um, I don't want to say just hitting because hitting is horrible or other forms of domestic violence in terms of emotional, um, psychological, financial manipulation. But if you don't have intervention early on, it often does escalate. And so a lot of Native women and um, two-spirit and Native person victims of um, of homicide in Indian country were before, before the homicide victims of domestic violence that just went unprosecuted. So VAWA, will, if passed, and we're working on a bipartisan VAWA in the Senate right now, if passed, would have a huge impact on it, addressing this crisis of murdered and mis missing indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit relatives. Wow, that really makes the case for tribal jurisdiction because if you address it early, you have the potential of saving basically murder. Absolutely, and I can't tell you how many times I've directly worked with victims' families where um, everyone in, in the community knows that the individual who murdered the native woman or girl that, that whose family I'm representing was a former lover, current spouse, ex-boyfriend. Um, these are, these are, you know, that we can have stranger homicide and it does happen. And we certainly have issues of sex trafficking and human trafficking where our native women and girls are picked up off the streets. But, um, we, we have a, such a high rate of intimate partner violence that, um, restoring tribal criminal jurisdiction over those crimes in, on tribal lands will have a huge impact on this crisis. Well, indeed, one of the themes in one of your plays, Sovereignty, gets into that very issue. And to me, that raises the whole question of invisibility. And so many of these issues wouldn't even be issues if people were aware of them and thinking it's not the same for Native women as it is for other women. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, a lot of us have been talking about sort of how we're peeling back that invisibility. You know, I think having the first Native Women Secretary at the Department of Interior makes a big difference, right? Having Native women in Congress makes a big difference. Having TV shows written by Native women um, with an executive producer that's a Native woman makes a big difference. We're, 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 we're starting to peel back some of that invisibility, but I think that we clearly see um, from various other facets, for instance, there's only ever been that I know of one Native woman in the entire history of the United States to be appointed by the president to serve as an Article Three federal judge, right? That, 
one out of the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands that have served since the United States came into existence. That's a huge deficit. That's a huge, that's invisibility, right? The fact that we've only ever had one Native woman clerk at the United States Supreme Court, one Native woman ever, and that was Justice Gorsuch who hired her, um, that's invisibility. And so I think we still have a lot of work to do. Um, most American theaters in this country have never produced a single play by Native playwright. As Illuminative reports, 87% of K through 12 education curriculum in this country does not include mention does not mention a single native person after 1900. So it's not surprising um, that folks are not educated on the impact of the historical use of violence as a colonial tool to dismantle the sovereignty of our tribal nations, as well as the impact of the Supreme Court's decision in Oliphant in 1978, and why we have a legal and cultural framework today that results in Native women being the population that are most likely to be murdered, raped, uh, and killed, assaulted um, in this country. And I think, hopefully, the more that we start to chip away at that invisibility, whether it's in government, arts and entertainment, education, other forms of uh, intersections of, of the United States. I think I that's what we have a lot of work to do. One of the challenges both with this issue and with uh, COVID has been data collection. Uh, are there some strategies that law enforcement and other agencies can use to get better at that? You know, I really tip my hat to the Urban Indian Health Institute headquartered in Seattle, who's been doing a lot of work sort of understanding the holes in the data collection. And as Abigail Echohawk has, has written about in the reports they've issued and spoken about, when we're outside of tribal lands, the problem is, is that non-native, non-tribal law enforcement, and especially in urban areas, does not consider whether the victim is a native woman does not consider tribal citizenship or whether outside of tribal citizenship, someone might be indigenous to a tribe outside the borders of the United States, for instance, First Nations or south of the border here. So we actually don't have accurate data nationwide on how this is affecting like the actual rates. We also know that on tribal lands, um, our tribal governments to date have for the most part been precluded from accessing national criminal databases. And so um, unfortunately our tribal law enforcement have not been given full access to enter those crimes when they're reported. And I also know that a lot of the victims' families that I represent, that our firm represents, when they go to a county, like maybe especially in border towns, right off tribal lands, off the reservation border to report a relative that is missing, oftentimes they're told, well, we're not gonna really consider that a crime. She probably ran away on purpose, which is really problematic. It's victim blaming. Um, more often than not, a crime is involved or there's abuse in the home. There's a reason a young native woman is running away or an older native woman or a native person, right? People um, most often are not running away um, just for fun. And so it is something that requires criminal investigation and needs to be treated as a crime until, until we know that that person who is missing is safe. And, and more often than not, they're not safe, right? And a crime is being committed, whether it's murder, um, kidnapping, sex trafficking, you name it. Um, and so we've had real resistance from local county law enforcement and, and their just refusal to enter the names of our missing native people into the national criminal databases. For instance, we have one young Native woman who is Kiowa who recently went missing in Oklahoma and they think she might be missing in Texas. Um, but again, we can't get the local county law enforcement to enter her name in the national database. And so how, how do you navigate these issues as tribal governments when you don't have access to those databases? Extraordinary, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Mary Catherine Nagel. Thank you so much for having me. And we'll be right back. Holly Cook Macaro joins us now. She's a partner at Spirit Rock Consulting. She's worked for Tribal Nations for more than 20 years. Welcome, Holly. Good afternoon, Mark. Thank you for having me. So we're coming up against an extraordinary deadline about getting $20 billion out the door. How are tribes prepared and how is the government uh, operating? 
I think that will be uh, the focus. So uh, the statutory deadline per the American Rescue Plan, they had 60 days to get to come up with a formula, formula, formula methodology um, and to determine how they were going to divide that money and get it out to tribes. And uh, the statutory deadline is May 10th. Uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs announced last week what their formula methodology would be for the funds that are flowing through the agency um, at the Department of Interior. But what all of Indian country is waiting for is what the formula will be to distribute the $20 billion that is going out directly to tribal governments, similar to the $8 billion that was in the CARES Act that we saw with the immediate impacts on the ground. So a, a tribal leadership is really, um, they, there were uh, four consultations and tribes from around the country weighed in with how their recommendations on, how, <clears throat> excuse me, how they thought those funds should be distributed. Um, I think it's clear based on the fact that the Department of Interior uh, did a data call on for tribes to submit and self-certify their enrollment numbers, and uh, that was a that was a key. Uh, point of contention from Indian country last time uh, because they used the Indian housing block grant numbers, which were um, not accurate in many cases, were the subject of litigation that had major action last week, as you know, in the Shawnee case. The, um, there were several other factors that were recommended by tribal leadership with some variations from around the country. Uh, I, so I think it's clear population will be um, one of the factors. There was discussion and recommendations that there that economic factors be included. In the last round, <clears throat> the economic factors that were included were uh, number of employees and the tribal government uh, budgets and um, disbursements in in 2019, the pre-pandemic numbers. So I really think that we will see something very similar to that. But also, I. I gotten the sense based on on feedback from folks in the administration that they really are trying to get it right. They're making sure the data is correct. They're trying to make sure that the um, Alaska Native villages and how they receive their services are addressed and covering those bases so that we don't see litigation and uh, a lot of the heartburn that was out there next uh, last last summer. So I expect to uh, on Monday to have that news. Uh, I really think they'll send out the 1 billion right off the bat. And I would be prepared for a, possibly another data call in terms of the economic factors since we haven't seen that data call yet from the Department of Treasury. Have you heard from tribes about how prepared they are for the implementation? I think there is the experience with the preparation for uh, for the CARES Act, I, I think, has, has helped prepare uh, tribal governments um, for what is about to come. This twenty billion dollars that we are about that is set to go out in five days, and and possibly the second the second tranche with the consideration of economic factors in the week or two after that, is the an unprecedented amount of resources going into Indian country. Uh, but thank, thankfully, we had the experience under the, under the CARES Act. Uh, I think there has been a lot of planning and preparation for how they are going to handle those funds. I, in general, I would say, think tribes will get maybe double what they got the last time around. Um, and so for some tribes, they're very, the, the tribes with uh, large populations, lower revenues, and uh, they're really counting on being able to use those funds to continue, say, the, the food provision for the elderly, um, those sorts of assistance that have really been critical in, in making sure that COVID didn't devastate their communities. And for those tribes that really have large economic operations, they've been preparing um, to address, I think, long-term, how they can um, safeguard from, from the effects of the pandemic. And we have 
We have places like the Navajo Nation where the devastation and impacts of COVID-19 were so great, but with the flexibility and the extended timelines with, with these funds and the, the purposes that were specifically outlined in the bill that should provide some opportunity to build the infrastructure that will protect their communities in the future. So I get the sense there's some preparation, but again, this amount of money has never gone out just in this short of time to Indian country. So I, I think we will uh, we will be seeing how it's handled in, in just a week or so. Well, and as you say, Holly, the challenge between making sure you have nutrition and programs like that uh, continuing, but also the opportunity for long-term, this is a, a, a access to capital that's never been seen in Indian country. And that's really how you create jobs. Yes, and in, in the, the the twenty billion that I'm talking about is that is the the tribal government relief fund. We have the new capital projects fund. There are several other uh, funds available for tribes in there as well. Those will create jobs. Capital projects will um, it will allow for um, employment in a number of different areas. So the the broad impacts, not just you know, keeping the tribal government afloat, but uh, the, the, I guess, peripheral benefits of these, it's employment in Indian country in a time when we are still in recovery. Thank you so much, Holly cook Macaro. Yes, thank you, Mark. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. We will be back with another edition tomorrow. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can. Oh, you got to run, you got to run. Indian Country Today is produced at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. This is Indian Country Today.